start of our show. I should do that too. Out all the horror episode about yeah. Halloween 2018. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> we just told you the whole story right here. <laughs> and I don't have a head. There I am. Hey, right, welcome to the Horror Academic uh, on this very nasally congested episode. But we'll tell you why in just one second. Welcome to the Horror Academic. I am Victoria, the Horror Academic. This is our co-host for the day, Melissa from the Brook Reading Podcast. But you knew that already because you've been following all the horror. <laughs> yeah. And all the horror, we have been talking about Halloween for the month of October. Um, last episode we did Halloween 1978. So this episode we are skipping directly. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. <laughs> Go directly to Halloween 2018. Because all that other stuff didn't exist. And most of it's not that great anyway. <laughs> Insert hate post here. <laughs> Sorry, guys. But, uh... At me. Yeah. At Brook Reading Pod. At, at the 077. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. But we'll talk a little bit about that stuff. Um, but, yes, welcome back to the Horror Academic. And our Halloween 2018 episode is part of All the Horror. Uh, Melissa of Brook Reading Podcast, would you tell us more about All the Horror? I would love to. So, um, All the Horror has turned into a monstrosity this year, which is super exciting, but also, first of all, so much work for so few people. Um, especially Sam over at Invasion of the Remake, I have to give you some more love for really pulling all the strings on the back end uh, production-wise. Um, every episode that has dropped every single day in October, plus bonus content, plus selling merchandise, plus running our Facebook page and creating a whole new website for us on Wix, um, has all been Sam from Invasion of the Remake with a couple extra helpers here and there, including Vic. Um, so All the Horror has been in a month-long indie podcasting slash author slash blogger slash videographer event celebrating the horror genre and celebrating the places in which it would fall, a la movies, books, comic books, role-playing games, whatever the case may be. Uh, all the podcasters that were involved last year are involved in some way, shape, or form this year. Uh, plus, like I said, we've just found so many new people who create content and wanted to be involved. Uh, Vic with her show, The Horror Academic. Um, Authors, like I said, bloggers, Ryan L. Terry, who's a huge horror fan and blogger. Um, there's just a lot of people coming together and just making fun Musicians, content for the writers. month. Of yes, oh my god. Yeah. So I can't believe I forgot. Sean made us an amazing theme for all the horror. Uh, Sean Faust, so rock on with that. Uh, there's just so much like cool stuff going on. And we've also turned this into a charity event. Um, Vic is very uh, um, connected with the group Scares Active. That Care. Yeah. Active. Thank you. Good word. Um, active with the group Scares That Care, which are horror creators that give money to charity for... What is the... Uh, Scares That Care is very different from other charities, as opposed to giving money just to a charity to gain uh, for a kind of, like, question of where the money goes. Yeah. Scares yeah. That Care is very different. Scares That Care, um, thanks to people like Joe Ripple, who uh, leads the group, they find... Uh, a few families every year and we know who we are giving the money to. So Scares to Care will find families in need that are dealing with uh, a mother with breast cancer, um, a child dealing with childhood cancer, uh, thanks to uh, the incorporation of uh, Kane Hodder. We also have uh, burn victims. So there's all oh, different wow. types of families in need and you get to know them through the Facebook group. And you know where your money's going, and you know how you're helping, and it's it's a very personal kind of charity. And everybody's horror fans, and that's great. And we have something in common, and a lot of them come to the convention every year, which is really cool. So, I highly recommend if you're a horror fan, if you're part of the horror community as a fan or as a creator, check out Scares to Care. It's a great it's a great thing, and I'm so happy that I can be a little bit a part of it every year. And look forward, there may be, uh, hopefully next year or next summer. The, uh, the horror academic might actually try and have some live content from Scares the Care charity event. Oh my god, that's so rad. Yeah. Um, yes, I know you've been talking about that. And thank you for extrapolating on what Scares the Care actually is. Um, I know a good amount of the proceeds from all the merch that we've been selling, uh, tagged all the horror, are going to Scares the Care um, because of Vic's recommendation and their close work with them. So that's super awesome. It's and great to keep it in the horror family. Yeah, keep A, keeping it in the horror family because that just, I know the stereotype is that 
horror people are either very emo or like not, you know, or just too weird. Either I mean, that or antisocial. just like antisocial. Yeah. Like, which is so not true. Obviously, like we love to talk about our craft or whatever we're into as much as the next person. And the, having that personal touch, I like that. I mean, yeah. I am the first one to write a check for cancer research or do a walk or whatever. But yeah, exactly. You do have to ask yourself where your money goes to yep. because I used to do walks for certain cancer organizations that I'm not going to name right now. But I used to do, and my family especially has donated hundreds of dollars to them because we've had people affected with breast cancer and things like that. And with the amount of just women in general in my family, that's a major thing for us. And then you find out that, you know, your money's not really going to where it's supposed to. And that's yeah. just, that's disquieting and disconcerting. So uh, organizations like this should be recognized and celebrated. And that's what we're also trying to do with all the horror, yep. uh, but also just to have fun with the genre that we all like and appreciate or create content for. Uh, so that's why it's been fun, too, to, like I said, inc incorporate authors and artists and musicians that have that sway to them. So that's been tons of fun. Um, so that's all the horror. If you want more updates on all the horror in regards to uh, what podcasts specifically are putting out all the horror-themed episodes or ATH-themed episodes, you can listen to any of the promos that I've been putting out over the past couple months. If you go on Twitter and you follow at AllTheHorror18 or follow the hashtag AllTheHorror, you'll find all of the podcasters and their own promotions through uh, through Twitter mainly. But as I said, we do have a Facebook page. Um, we also have, as I said, a, a, a standalone established All the Horror website, which we will put on the link right there <laughs> for you. <laughs> so go check it out and listen to all the other amazing content that's been out, including my show. Yep, uh, Brick Meeting yep. Podcast, which yep. has also, since Melissa's been on this show talking about Halloween. I have been on her show talking about Halloween. Yes. Uh, and this conversation will work together in tandem. So um, we're not going to... We just... For her episode, we did a very in-depth blow-by-blow of the story of Halloween 2018. So we're going to do it a little different on this one so that if you're going to listen to that, you're going to have different content in this one today. So mm -hmm. please stick with us even though we're talking about the same movie. <laughs> I know we had tons to talk about with 1978, Halloween, mm -hmm. 2018, maybe not as much to talk about because there's a little less history. It's only last year. but um, And this is different for the horror academic because we're talking about a movie that was made last year as mm -hmm. opposed to a movie made like 30 years ago. So this will be a little different for us. Also, I'm going to just say this up front. I am sick. I'm sorry. This is how I'm going to sound for the rest of this episode, and I'm going to try not to cough or sneeze on any of you. Especially <laughs> Melissa, because that would be really rude to invite her over to the higher academic realm just to sneeze and cough on her. We've been sharing germs for over 20 years now. I'm okay with it. It's not a problem. Thank but, you, though, for your kindness. <laughs> I try. So today's movie, like we are saying, is Halloween 2018. Um, this is, for those of you who may not have seen it yet, um... This is kind of the sequel that didn't happen. <laughs> and this is the sequel that took 40 years to happen. That's the other way to look at it. We know there was Halloween 2. Halloween 3 is downstairs. Um, somewhere on the shelf I have 4 and 5. Uh, 6 I actually kind of like. Um, there was the remade Halloween and its sequel. How many are there? This is 9 I believe, dude. 9? Yeah. And I know it's not chronological because like, isn't there like Halloween H2O? Oh shit! Yeah, I forgot H2O. Okay, so oh, there's, and there's not the nine. other three. Huh? Wait. So we're up to like 46, if you've been counting, which is nuts. Um, Holy! Oh, it's probably behind your chair. Oh, there's a lot of them. Yeah. There's yeah. We got one through six, then H2O. Did then, that have then a sequel? That had two sequels, right? That mm. had two sequels. There's a lot of Halloween. Um, I'm not going to... that guy. Yeah. See, and I'm not going to, like, burst any bubbles here, but aside from the original one, and until this one happened, my favorite was part three. I mean, I love the original, uh, but I think part three was very cool because it was different, and it was a very different story, and it didn't kind of, like, fall into your expectations of what a Halloween movie had to be. Cool. Which is cool. Something different and new. I love that. Um... But yeah, I like Michael Myers. I want to see what else we can do with Michael Myers. So, basically a bunch of other movies happened <laughs> for various reasons. Um, and then 40 years later, 
uh, Blumhouse gets involved and they say, well, what if we reboot from here? What if we say, you know, let's celebrate the anniversary of the film and do a sequel that we could not have done before. Let's see what happens to Laurie Strode later. And I know we've kind of done this with H2O, where we see Laurie Strode later in life, 20 years later, and she's a headmistress at a, a private school, and Janet Lee has a brief cameo. That part's kind of oh. cool. But, you know, really um, not a great movie. So I think everybody was fine with saying that didn't happen. Um, now, I'm sorry, may I interrupt with a question? Go for it. Because I remember us briefly touching upon H2O when we talked about 1978. Mm -hmm. Was her, what, did she still play Laurie Strode? She was just yeah. a headmistress? She actually changed her name in that story so that she didn't, so she wasn't Laurie Strode. Well, so that's what I'm saying. So she was. But she was Laurie Strode, but under a pseudonym. And it was this whole that's thing, and she ends up. <sighs> It's another story for another day. That okay, sorry. It's not. It's not. It's not the most rewatchable. Okay. Like I can watch Halloween every year and I'm cool. Yeah, same. I mean, I've watched it a couple times. Once, you know, like I've had one, one or two years where I've watched it a few times just because I got a chance to like see it on the big screen or. Oh, that's cool. Cool additions that come out. But they've had like Fathom events with it or whatever stuff. Oh, like that was before all that. Oh, okay. But like, uh, you know, so Halloween's the kind of movie I can watch over and over. Halloween three is the kind of movie I can watch over and over. Um, I'd watch this one again. And this I mean, one, I think, is really original in, in the way yeah, it looks at it. Absolutely. And it's like, it's realistic. I'm going to get rid of this little case. Um, so, let's give some of the skinny about this one. So, it came out 2018. This was the reuniting, in some ways, of Jamie Lee Curtis and John Carpenter. Really how it was touted. John Carpenter's actually more like a executive producer on the project. Uh, his main I influence on this project, though, is the score. Um, if you're like me and you're a big fan of Carpenter, you've probably been following the fact that he's been on tour the last couple years. I've been lucky enough to see him twice oh, wow. perform with his son and the group that they have, and they just do his cover songs and lots of songs that are kind of like um, scores for movies that didn't happen yet. Oh no! Which is really cool. So it's like score-like music and it sounds like a John Carpenter movie but there's no movie. Um, so those were really fun concerts and so it was kind of taking the culmination of what he's doing now in his career of being more of a musician and going back and revisiting a score that he wrote years ago which was so influential, right? Mm -hmm. I mean like and we talked about that a lot oh, in yeah. the last episode. Um, so this is his opportunity with his son and their collaborator to kind of sit down and go, well, what can we do to, to like revamp this and like do something new and special with it? And I think this is extremely effective, so effective that I'm going to recommend you go out and buy the soundtrack. Oh my god, yeah. Oh my god, so good. Definitely. It's amazing. It's, it's definitely a modernization, but it plays with the original tones very well. And I think you'll be very happy if you're a fan of Carpenter's music. So I didn't know he was a musician until today. I mean, I didn't know that he's most a whole of his movies. side thing that he's got going yeah. on. He's super talented. Oh yeah, he's, he's yeah. a triple play. Yeah, that's amazing. So, and it's one of the reasons why I'm such a fan of his, because that's that was totally my directive. Well, that's you too. Yeah. I was going to say, that's, that's the things that you're talented in are the same things that he is. So, yep. yeah. Because Vic's super talented. I don't know if y'all know this. I try. But she's, she's a musician and a filmmaker in her own right. And talented AF. I got moments. I did some cool things sometimes. But... Awkward. She's like, neither here <laughs> nor there, people. Yeah, I, don't, I digress. I'll toot her horn if she doesn't want to. I don't care. I mean, that's okay. fine. <laughs> okay. Toot toot. The, uh, so the people that bring this movie to actually be made. We have, um, director is David Gordon Green. He is the one who comes up with the modernization of the concept. He's super fan. Grew up very influenced by the film Halloween. He's not someone who typically works in horror which is kind of what Blumhouse is trying to do, is to take other new directors and bring them into the horror genre. Um, so working with them together, uh, along with the co-writers. Now, the writing credits was interesting. First <laughs> off, it's always interesting when there's five people in the credits. Um, that's not always a great thing, but the fact that two of them, they're giving credit to John Carpenter and Deborah Hill for their work on the original film and how it's following that those storylines directly, that's a little better off. So that's the first two credits. Then you have 
David Gordon Green again, and Danny McBride. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> this did not really add up to me the first time I watched this movie. I was like, okay, it's you know, Danny McBride, okay. I didn't think of it until watching it today with Melissa. We're like, and I was like, holy crap. Eastbound and Down wrote this movie? That's the And she was like, I don't know guy. if it's the same guy. And yeah. I was like, we'll find out. We but it up. is. So that was kind of crazy cool. to me. Uh, you know, I like, like, like this new modern ability that people have to work across genres. Uh, it's definitely Especially something. Especially like comedy. Right? Yeah, going from comedy to horror. I mean, that's something that is not was not common back in the day. And a lot of directors and writers would have loved to have more flexibility. So it's awesome to see that happening now. I mean, especially you look at things like Get Out and, and Us with Jordan Peele and mm -hmm. how he had such a huge comedy career now to see him in horror and we love him in horror and we need to just keep him in horror because yeah. he's very good at it. Yeah. But uh, it's cool to see people can do this now. Yeah. So that's, that's thumbs up. Yeah. And we mentioned Bill Hader's performance in It Chapter 2 as well, which was super amazing and I've I've been enjoyed his performances anytime I've seen him in SNL yeah. or anything like that. And he did kill it with the comedy in the movie, but he also <coughs> killed it with showing actually human <coughs> fear and stuff like that. So I, I like seeing that flip. Too. We did discuss that um, mm -hmm. on your episode yes, about It Part 2, which you should check those out because yeah. we talked a lot about It Part 1 and Part 2. Yeah. Um, luckily it was a plethora of us that got to talk about it together, mm -hmm. which was a lot of fun, and yeah, I hope you guys fun. check that out. Um, but it is great to see horror actors who are from other places too, and, yeah. and comedians have an excellent um, ability to flow like that. And there's something about comedy timing that brings you into any, any other genre very yeah. well. And it also ties back to breaking the mold, just like Scares the Cares do, do. Like, certain people who, especially, I, I, I overhear conversations of people who say, like, I'm not into horror, I'm not into scary movies, uh, I like me a good rom-com, I like this, this, and that. And I'm one of the people that can, I can bounce between genres, and just, if I like a good movie, I like a good movie. That's pretty much how I feel. But I've listened to people kind of only recently I was with a group of people doing actually a walk for cancer and somebody behind me was just like uh, you know those people that wear black t-shirts and see those movies they're not the type of people I want like to teach my child and I'm like oh wait a minute guess who's gonna be teaching your kid when they come into fifth grade this motherfucker right here. Like, to get up to but, college, see you then. Yeah, exactly. Like, there's stereotypes that need to be broken, and, like, groups like Scares the Care do that, and comedians being in Jordan Peele's work and Bill Hader's work and all these other people, all these other creative types, just showing their creativity is important. It doesn't matter what... You don't have to be pigeonholed. Like, obviously, oh, yeah. John Carpenter's not pigeonholed. He's just a director. He's an amazing musician. Would you know that if you... You know, like, you have to... Peel back the layers of the onion in order to find this stuff out. So, yeah. you know. I mean, and even if it's not like... Damn it. It's not like we're stuck in <laughs> and the there's 80s. my five-minute rant. <laughs> there it was. We missed it in yours. We did miss it in mine. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, fans of the horror academic who's used to a nice, calm demeanor. <laughs> Get that in the book reading. Yeah. But, uh, what, um... No, I mean, it's not the 80s anymore, right? It's just because you like uh, heavy metal and uh, role-playing games and horror movies and Stephen King books doesn't mean yeah. you're, like, the low-life, uh, you know scumbag who hangs out in front of 7-Eleven. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> we're parts of society now, dude. <laughs> or the quick stop. Catch up. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so I mean, I, I think what this movie does effectively is kind of bring us into the modern world mm -hmm. and bring Absolutely. the story into the modern world. And it's great to see how um, it was a, a, a more mature story. Yeah. Um, because you gotta deal with maturity in these kind of stories. Mm. Um, I actually wanted to start off before we really get into the movie more, I wanted to ask you, because this actually was your idea. <laughs> uh -oh. Blaming you. That's fine. A year ago, you were like, hey, this sounds really cool. I love the trailer. I want to see this movie. Um, but I was like, well, we got to watch Halloween first. <laughs> Which led us down this rabbit hole that you guys are hanging out with us for. But, um, so what made you want to watch this movie is my question. I did really enjoy the trailer. Um, I also enjoy... Not enjoy. That's a weird way to say that, but like, the Friday the Thirteenth movies and Nightmare on Elm Street movies, for some reason, never appealed to me. Um, Scream did. I saw all four Screams in the theater. I can't remember with whom. I think the first one might have been with you guys. The no, second and she's third. She's saying no. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know you guys yet when the first one. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. Yep. God. And I, you're okay. a better man than me if you saw part four in the theater. I did, because I, I was so invested with the yeah. whole series. I was into it, and I went to the fourth one, and yeah, by the fourth one, I was like, wow, this is not good anymore. <laughs> but I 
that's another aspect of um, other movies that I do really enjoy. I like teen dramas or whatever you want to call them, all the way back from John Hughes. But even those 90s ones with like yeah, yeah. young Chris Evans with like whipped cream all over him, I was still into it. I like those movies. They're amusing to me. They're I, I get the heart of them and I appreciate the characters and stuff. So knowing a little bit that this had that tie-in, I kind of liked it. But Michael Myers, and maybe because we talked about this in the last episode of The Horror Academic, how emotionless and how faceless he is, I'm like then where is this creepiness coming from? I'm like, because that's a creepy MF. Mm -hmm. Like, Freddy Krueger's scary is so right in your face. And Jason's is so right in your face. His is not. It's all hidden. And when I have to, again, I go back, when I have to, like, peel back those onions and figure out that mystery, and that's, again, why I like Stephen King books, because I can do the same thing there, and it's that character study, I'm like, there's something behind this, and I want to check it out. And then, yeah, when I saw that trailer, to, <laughs> I really have to do a trailer podcast. Yes. <laughs> I really, really need to. That needs to be I'm, my, like, I don't know how my went from the brook reading podcast to so like what, what the trailer powers? junkies yeah. <laughs> a podcast i can't call it that that's stealing from somebody um but tbd trailer podcast. i really love trailers and that one just like i said seeing I, the theme of the movie and the the heavy message of um learning from your foremothers and having that maternal strength passed down to you whether it was taught or just because it's in your blood that came across in a two and a half minute trailer, mm. like throwing in my face. And I was just like, oh my God, I have to see this. And then the, like the mystery of Michael Myers yep. too. I was like, okay, I didn't want to go down the entire rabbit hole, which is, I'm glad why we did the bookends. And I don't know if I'm ever going to watch the 13 other sequels that happened in between. I, I don't There's, know if I, I mean, I can see I mean, I'll be in for a couple. Maybe, like, yeah, like I said, maybe two or three, maybe yeah. two and three. You guys have been talking about two a lot. And then you're saying you're like three. Three's, but it's a whole that different That might be where I stop. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I don't know. I don't know what, what dragged me in other than those things that I just said. So I guess I do know. Well, <laughs> but I mean, I, it's fair also to say, I mean, uh, I, I, obviously when I saw the trailer, I'm like, oh, a new Halloween movie and Jamie Lee Curtis is in it. You know, that might be, that. that's something I'm going to want to see in the theater. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen, I saw part six in the theater uh, when I was a teenager. And I saw the two Rob Zombies in the theater uh, as a oh, fan of I forgot of about them, too. Yep. Okay. So, I mean, uh, and, you know, I've seen all of them at least once in there a couple times, most of them. So, I've definitely, I don't know if I'm as big a fan of it as a series mm -hmm. as I am, say, Nightmare on Elm Street, where I'm a super fan. Okay. Um, I'm a big fan of the movie Halloween. Uh, and I'm a huge, I mean, you all know I'm a Carpenter fan, it's just tough yeah. part of me. So, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like all in to check it out. And then when I started seeing the press junkets that, um, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis was doing on like the morning TV shows and things like that, talking about, you know, this is a woman dealing with trauma 40 years later. Mm -hmm. And that, this is the crux of this film. It's how it affects her and how it affects the women in her life and her family. Mm -hmm. And I was like... Oh shit! I need to see this, and that started to just pull you in. Yeah, because I'm like, like yeah. so this is like my thesis, right? Yeah. So this is about you know women in <laughs> oh horror. God, yeah. So it yeah. is. This is women in horror. Yeah. So yeah. um, I mean, I I know that that was the, like the final thing for me, where I was like, we got to see this like opening weekend, because I I really need to know what what happens. Yeah. And I was yeah. very happy to see it in the theater. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, oh well, I would love to show you this movie after you see Halloween. No, that's yeah. absolutely fine, and I'm glad we did it the way we did yeah. it. And then also when we brought this conversation back this year when we started to plan for all the horror, and you talked to me about, well, okay, if we are going to combine our two forces and make content together, what do we want to talk about? And the easy answer to me would have been, let's do something Stephen King. But I already knew in my show I had the plan in my show of what I was going to be doing yeah. so I I didn't want to cross pollinate that much mm -hmm. where it was going to infect my like my summer of king that I just did or if I do do anything in the future with the shining and dr sleep coming out so I'm like okay I really don't want to infect I'm like well what's the other horror thing that I have an interest in I'm like Ugh, still haven't seen Halloween yet yep. so there we go and I knew That's again too that you were a huge fan yeah. and that you have so much uh academic insight and then there's the, the added bonus factor of seeing Talking Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. Especially, I'm sorry, cough drops. So just, just, I gotta, I have extra stuff today. Sorry, guys. But, um, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis, uh, she's a strong woman. And, yeah. you, I mean, you get that from the first movie. We, we talked about that extensively. And she's, she's a powerful person. And to see her proudly being part of this... 
um, was a plus for me. Mm -hmm. I know that she is someone, eh, I mean, she kind of personified Scream Queen for many years and mm -hmm. walked away from it and was like, I can't keep doing this. And, you know, that's not her thing. And we understand she's not a horror fan. So knowing that there's a script that brought her back in, mm -hmm. I mean, I know she tried with H2O. It's like, okay, it's 20th anniversary, you want me to do what? Sure, fine. Oh my god, that came out 20 years ago. We were in college. That's nuts. Sorry for that side note. 2019. Yeah, I was I was getting ready to leave. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's weird. Oof. Yeah. Okay. So that was 20 years ago. Yeah. And we're old. So 40 <laughs> years later. So 20 years later. Well, when... I said 1978 came out when I did. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, knowing that she was willing to do it again was important to me, I think, yeah. to see, well, now she's got to feel that this is a good enough story. And story is king, right? So sure. If, if she's all in, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there for her. So yeah. very happy that the result was so good. Yeah. What the filmmakers decide to do with this film is to throw out the sequels and to say there was the original one made in 1978 and no, 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 nobody made any movies after that, no, 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 and then 19, uh, 40 years later, hey, let's make another movie. Um, why did they choose to do that? I think that's also what intrigued me too. Right. That idea of there were so many in the middle and then the fans were just going to go, okay, we're all right with this, let's see how you do this. Right. I was intrigued by that too. Well, I mean, I think it helped that they had just been through a remake cycle. And not everybody, we had discussed this as well, was happy with the remake cycle. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that part two of the remake uh, in the theater I was not on board with. It made no sense. And then when I saw the director's cut, I understood what was supposed to happen. Okay. And, okay, I was, I was in for that. Very different storytelling. I know Carpenter oh, wow. and Zombie even have had, you know, differing opinions on if that worked or not. Okay. But that was like a, a point where we said, okay, we have to restart. And then if we're going to drop from there and not do another one in that cycle, what's the? how do we get back on track? Okay. And one way to do that is easily to, to wipe the slate clean. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I was surprised that they did not keep the um, kind of through story of Halloween 2. Um, for those of you who haven't seen Halloween 2, it takes later that night. Mm -hmm. So it's like Halloween 1 happens... Uh, you know, Loomis shoots... Spoiler! If you didn't watch last episode. Go back and watch. Come Loomis on. shoots Michael, he falls off the balcony, we look over and he's gone. Movie credits roll, right? So, this is saying, like an hour later, this is what happens next. Mm -hmm. And that's what Halloween 2 does. And Carpenter was involved, he was one of the co-writers, we discussed this as well. Um, I had kind of assumed they were going to stick to that storyline. Because it was still kind of... It's the canon. same day. Right, yeah, yeah, I mean... So, um, I was surprised that they didn't say, okay, everything after Halloween 2 didn't happen. Because um, it does get convoluted. I'm sorry. This is the problem with 4 and 5. I don't... I couldn't tell you uh, a good deal of what 4 and 5 mean. 6, I like that it had all these ideas, but they're never really brought to fruition. So... And the H2O storylines are just kind of out there. So... It sometimes is easier to be like, look, we have this iconic film that everybody knows already. Mm -hmm. And there's these sequels that most people may have seen. Maybe. We don't know. Yeah. So I think that's another place where it's like, well, we don't have to worry about all that baggage. If we're just going to go with the fact that it's 40 years later, we're going to assume that, you know, even if you're an 18-year-old kid, you've probably seen Halloween 1. Mm-hmm. We're going to hope you've seen Halloween 1. If you're a horror fan, I'm guessing yeah. it's one of the... Like, even it's if you're a young be, kid, like, you're a classic. Things. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Check it out. When I was a teenager getting into horror films, it was like, you watch the number one of everything and then go from there. Yeah. And that was kind of how we did, you know? Well, if you're a fan of anything that's a series, you have to start with the original. We say that all the time. I right. I mean, I've read a lot of book series, especially growing up. You always had to start with the first one. And I don't, I don't understand people ability to just jump in at number three no and i i don't but i don't even get it when you walk in someone's house and they're like oh sit down i'm watching a movie oh what movie is it? i don't know i just turned it on in the middle <laughs> <laughs> i mean if i turn on the tv and there's a movie on and i don't know it i'm probably going to change the channel if it's if it's a movie i know and i'm so familiar with like if I turn on the TV and, like, Mall Rats is on, and if it's in the middle, I'm probably okay. just going to stick around and watch the end. How many times you know? have we seen Because I've seen that yeah. 60 million times. 
But yeah, if I don't know it, I'm Jane Silent. Speaking of, I like literally that was just the first movie that popped in my head. But Snoochie Boochie Brody Noochies. Snoochies. But yeah. But so. I mean, so I think that's probably why it's easiest to say let's just go straight from the beginning. Everyone knows the beginning and then forget the middle. Nobody cares anymore. Yeah. And I think that's a bold move. But I think they work things into the uh, first 20 minutes of the film that kind of set you straight. Um, we talked about this on your show, how there's some expositional conversations that are probably a little bit more conversation than you want yeah. that early in the movie. Yeah. But um, they do effectively tell you, hey, only five people died. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, so that whole other stuff that happened that night doesn't count. Mm -hmm. And, oh, wasn't that her brother? No, that's just some bullshit story. Oh, okay, so that didn't happen either. So that, mm -hmm. to me, pretty boldly says... We're leaving out part two. It erases everything, yeah. Right, and it, and that, that will tell me from there that the rest of it doesn't count either. Mm -hmm. Let's go through a few things from the story that we liked or didn't like. Okay. How do we feel about the old oh, British podcasters in the beginning of the, the movie? It's funny. As we were talking on the Brook Reading Podcast, I... If you ha if I may have mentioned this or not, I can't remember, but I listen to a lot of other indie podcasts, obviously being in that community. Um, the majority of the ones I listen to, ironically enough, are movie podcasts. And I believe I actually listened to a couple guys that I like who reviewed Halloween back in the day. I was going through their back catalog, and when they had seen it, I think they were both in the theater watching it together because they wanted to do it specifically for their show, and they thought it was cute that they were like, oh my god, look, podcasters, podcasters made it to like a big film, and you know, it's such, we feel like it's such an indie <clears throat> thing, and that like normal mainstream people don't know anything about it, which, not really That's the not case really anymore. anymore, not with like yeah. My Favorite Murder blowing up and like everything like that, you know, so there, there are those big ones, but, um... I honestly thought when we were introduced to those first two characters that they were some kind of a documentarian, mm. like a true crime documentarian. I didn't go podcast. I didn't right. think that. And then when one of them said, like, well, if we just offer Lori money, she'll talk to us. And they were like, oh, we're podcasters. What do you mean? She's not going to want to talk to us. We're investigative reporters. And I, yeah. And they had to keep giving themselves new titles to just make, to legitimize themselves. Because, like, if they're just going to pull up and be like, hey, we're podcasters and we want to chat, she's going to be like, get the fuck off my lawn. Yeah. Um, so that did kind of give me a little chuckle. And I appreciate that you let me find yeah. out that they were podcasters. I was going to mention it. And I was like, no, I'm just going to let you discover that on your own. I appreciate it. Um, I didn't I didn't care what their job was. I didn't yeah. need them. Yeah. I and don't, I I don't think they were very effective. No, they were. At what their job was, whatever um, it was. I wasn't sad that, you know, that they were not in the movie for very long. I understand that they needed to be there because they brought back a tantamount prop that right. didn't need I to mean, be in the movie. Um, you get that. So I get that. But, but I mean, we could have found another way for that to happen. We could have found another way. There's um, no way a random po indie podcaster, especially. Well, British podcasters would have, um, you know, gotten the, the time and the money to. They have to go through the sea. Yeah, but to, to get it from this. the attorney general, they have right. to go through the consulate, I mean, and it's like a whole political thing. I, I mean, I'm going to assume at this point that they are like some major sponsored podcast that are in a network, okay, probably maybe. the BBC. If you're doing a something yeah. with that big of a budget exactly that you're waving around a couple of grand to get you know Lori Strode to open her door yeah but um I don't know if they were effective I don't know if that was the uh filmmakers going let's be current and make them yeah. podcasters of course. um which you know whatever that's what I'm saying like it's cute but it's still surprising because I'm like really people know about that stuff well I mean there is some big mainstream you're stuff right, out there right, now yeah. but I mean you know I don't know if they were the most effective characters ever. I don't know, even know why they were British. Um, that <laughs> That's was true. random to me. That's, yeah. Uh, Europeans in this storyline are very random. Listen, it doesn't get any better either after them. <laughs> I mean, we have uh, who uh, we lovingly refer to in the Brook Reading Podcast as Fake Loomis, our, you know, psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever, uh, who's in charge of Michael in the beginning of the film and is kind of the flow-through of, you know, information. He is this Euro mutt kind of, I don't even know his real name. Uh, we were like, well, is like he German, German English? What is he? Yeah, I don't know. Like, and he, um, not an, another not quite right, fleshed out character who uh, ends up being not right in the head. Yeah. Um, Talk about not right. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, we have some interesting relationships with Europeans in this film. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so aside from those two, is there anything else that we really didn't care for in this film? Uh, the teenagers? Oh, yes, all of them. <laughs> all yes. of the teenagers. Yes. And you actually made a really good point before. You said um, that people were looking forward to a mature retelling of this a beloved, you know, beloved classic horror yeah. tale. We did want to see the maturity of the main right. character that we fell in love with the first time and we followed and we were like, what's happening to her now? Do we need all these twitty teenagers setting up stuff for us? No. I'm an intelligent movie watcher. Right. I, and I, the general public is an intelligent... Uh, they, we are intelligent enough as a, a movie watching group of people to catch things that you're going to put right. out to us. I don't need a teenager who doesn't even sound like a teenager. You sound like a, the DSM-5 or 4 like spouting therapy words to get me to understand yeah. what's going on with the character. Let me find it out organically like you did in 1978. Well, even so, I mean, what uh, what about the story required the teenagers at all? I mean, None of um, it. we've we learn in the beginning that Myers isn't seeking out teenagers as victims because nope. his first kill is a little kid. Mhm. Mm um there's there's no draw through there. He's randomly going through homes during uh, trick-or-treating hours at Halloween, mm -hmm. so he's not particularly looking for teenagers then. No, his second um, kill is a mom. Yeah, uh, which is a callback to part two, because she's a woman with a very large knife cutting a ham sandwich, um, and then gets, like, hammered to the head, like, like over and over times. and over and over, and you're like, all right, already, she's dead. But, um, yeah, I mean... The entire teenage arc is unnecessary aside from the fact that the granddaughter adds a third dimension to the, mm -hmm. the women of the family. Which the I thought was important. Right, but I don't think I needed to but meet any of her friends. No. And that no. entire party sequence, uh, the Halloween party at the high school. Yeah. We could ditch all of that. Yeah, it was literally the first five minutes of Carrie's prom, like when everything yeah. was still nice yeah. and Tommy was a good guy and Carrie was still like clean and pretty. Plunked. Into this movie, but with thumpy thumpy music instead yeah, of like right. you know, seventies that kind of stuff, dancing music. Yeah. Um, but again, completely unnecessary. Unnecessary. We could have easily removed that without harming the storyline in any way. Yeah. Um, if you literally just went to see her as the person who's stuck in between the conflict between her mother and her grandmother, mm -hmm. um, seeing her at school in those scenes yeah. was very good. There's a beautiful callback to part one oh. uh, when you see her in the classroom it. and it looks exactly like the classroom we saw Lori in back in the original. And then when she looks across the way Lori had looked across and seen Michael Myers, you know, she looks across and there's her grandmother. Mm -hmm. Beautiful setup. I and mean, the girl even looks, I mean, she resembles a young Jamie Lee Curtis. She's got long, like, kind of curly, wavy hair. And she's built very similarly, like, even face structure. And yeah. she just does that, like, delicate look out the window. And I'm like, oh my god, Yeah. 40 years ago. It was wonderful, that regard. And it was cool to see in the credits that the teacher that I don't think we actually even see in that sequence was played by PJ Souls. Yay! So there's another tie back, which is nice. Yeah. There's a, lots of these little moments that are set up for fans yeah. that I think are very nice. The Halloween fan Easter eggs were cool. Yeah. If they weren't so long and drawn out. Like, the yeah. ones that were just quietly little, plunked in? Yeah. Perfect. There's um, a, like, like uh, my favorite was a moment where um, uh, Michael had just, uh, you know, killed one of the babysitters upstairs in the house. The only babysitter, by the way, in this entire story, mm -hmm. so there really is no other need for any of the other teenagers if you just kept the babysitter element. Yeah. And I think the, um, the storyline and the characters in that scene uh, play well enough on their own. You didn't need everybody else. Um, but after that kill... We jump outside where Laurie Strode pulls up in her car because she's been tracking him, and we see three trick or treaters walk down the path, and one's oh, yeah. uh, wearing a witch, one's wearing a pumpkin jack o' lantern, and the third's wearing a skull. And it's obviously this little crew of you know Halloween three season of the witch mm -hmm. masks, which is perfect, and, and you know two points for them for putting that in there. Um, yeah, we have a couple nods to part two, quite a few to part one. And they're really nice little vignette moments. Mm -hmm. And, I, I mean, really, I think my biggest disappointment with this film, and this is something that I'm, I'm going to say is very generic of this decade of horror films, is um, I'm bored by the high school element. Yeah. Even if that's something that brought you in on the older stories. Sure. I don't know if we need it in a story about, a, you know, a woman who's close to 60? Yeah, she'd be yeah, 58. 58. Yeah, mm -hmm. so a 58-year-old woman 
uh, you know, battling her demon, literally. Yeah. So, I, I don't know if that element is needed. And that was probably my biggest issue with this film. Otherwise, yeah. I enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, I think and the last half hour of the movie is excellent. Oh, I perfect. Mean, you look at Laurie Strode, and we, I mean, we were just talking about this on your show, mm -hmm. where it, you, you instantly, once you see well, who is she has become and what has she had made her home and her life to be, she's very Sarah Connor. Mm -hmm. And it goes very Terminator, yeah. because um, she's just such a vigilante at this yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. The only thing that I can think of is, um, you know, with the with the extra scenes with all the teenagers. Okay, we know one of the main characters, one of the people in this maternal line, which is the underlying theme throughout m the majority of it, other than Lori dealing with her demons. Is that okay? You're trying to set the stage for her granddaughter. What is her life like in 2018 with podcasters now and with all this new stuff, and how is she living her life? But her boyfriend was completely unnecessary. Um, we talked about a lot of the men in this movie were completely unnecessary. Yeah. And if you do a quick comparison to the 1978, there are very, very few male characters in yeah. 1978. And they're not... It's not as obvious that they're, they're not being rendered as unnecessary in 1978. Dr. Loomis has more of a strong presence than the, than the fake Loomis in this one. Um, he, and the, the cops, the, the, the same thing. I mean, the sheriff, and, and the same father, thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, but there were like... There were just men thrown into this at what I felt like anyway for the sake of doing it that they all became unnecessary and maybe it added fuel to the fire that it wanted to show you that women can rock on their own and pull the, yeah. the Sarah Connor vigilante card. But it was it just also slowed down a lot. Yeah. Like the scene where her um where Allison, Lori's granddaughter, is fighting with her boyfriend. It slogs. Yeah. And literally, if you look at the clock, it might only be about a minute and a half or two minutes. But it's, it's you know what's coming, but and it just my keeps going. my brain is just slogging through, and I'm like, just like, oh, I don't care. And then to go through an entire post-sequence of that, where she is now talking to her, her questionable um, best friend of, we're not quite sure, listen yeah. to Brooke reading for our different interpretations <laughs> of him, um, but having this long, drawn-out conversation with him now about, yeah. you know... I'm sick and tired of having such a bad boyfriend and blah, blah, blah. And then yeah. him becoming, you know... Sitting there having a full-out conversation by himself and then, in essence, with Michael. But even to the point where he's a bad boyfriend to her for five minutes. And yeah. it's like... So all of it is to set up that all of these men in her life are not helpful. Are not reliable. Right. Her father, I mean, her boyfriend, her friend. Her, her father is a yo -yo. much weaker. <laughs> who... I do like the metaphor yeah. when uh, Laurie Strode... Uh, brings her family into her compound once Michael is uh, out and they know it. And, uh, you know, she's trying to gear up the, her, her daughter Karen and, and Karen's husband, and she gives Karen a shotgun, you know, like a, a rifle, mm -hmm. you know, she grabs her shotgun, and she gives the husband, you know... This tiny little, like, purse revolver, and is like, this won't stick. Yeah. So this will be for you, because clearly you're not going to get off a shot anyway, and we don't right. want you to be fiddling with a gun that doesn't work because you're a man and, and things it don't work for you. Kind of reminded <laughs> me of in uh, Men in Black, the pea shooter gun. That you there you go. Little. That's yeah. exactly what. It, yeah. But and then, and then when you go back to them later, while we're trying to find out where the granddaughter is, he's literally in the basement playing with a yo-yo mm -hmm. while everybody else is having these existential moments of, I'm, you know, why did you do this to my life, and mm -hmm. where, you know, all you did was train me. But yeah. why? And you know, it's it's. Uh, yeah. He was he proved being a he was being a yo yo. Yeah, like, literally. So I mean, you that know. part might have actually hit us in the head a little harder. Yeah. But uh, I think it is you know a setup, which is interesting considering that the writers were men. Um, the director was a man. Yeah. The producers, there's like twenty of them, but most of them were men. Yeah. Jamie Lee Curtis, by the way. Yes. Um, you know, so it's it's interesting that men even feel the need to kind of stress the importance of women's strength by showing male weakness. Yeah. Um, that's a, an uncanny thing to, to realize that when it's... This is from men's minds. I didn't even think of that, actually, until you said it. I yeah. do remember that the main screen writer in 78 was Deborah Hill, and that's why we got such well-rounded three-dimensional characters right. of the three girls, especially, and then, you know, and then mainly Laurie. And then this one, but I actually kept saying, like, they're so one-dimensional, and why are they so one-dimensional? Why are the characters so one-dimensional? But I mainly yeah. kept talking, I realize now, I mainly kept complaining about that, about the male characters, yeah. and Karen a little bit. 
Right. Her daughter, daughter was very stuck. Because, yeah, yeah. I was like, is your tool... Like, when we watched 1978 and I realized that Tommy's role was to teach and guide the Watcher... Yeah. I'm like, okay, was that Karen's role too? But she's just not as cute and as endearing as Tommy, so she's pissing me off. Well, she's like, also, is that what it is? It, is it the modernization of it that she only speaks in, in like therapy talk? Therapy talk, and yeah. it's like um, well, maybe know, you know. Which she talks about that a little bit with uh, it part two. Now that I'm thinking about it, when, when inner we, child therapy. Well, mm -hmm. but not even the oh. inner child therapy. The um, the hypochondria being a modernization as well. Okay, the yeah, way yeah, that yeah. it's expressed yeah. in such like kind of you know, uh, psycho babble. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's like, you know, it, it proves to this generation, I guess, this, yeah. and this is your n neurosis or, or whatever. I know, and I have to keep thinking about that, too. It's funny, you know, you bring up it, the original being made in 85 and then the miniseries in 90 and then the new one being adapted for but being placed in present day. The, the people who go to, yeah, the people who are filling the seats in the theaters... I didn't realize what the different mindset is, but now that I'm... I can see it because it's being reflected in all these movies. Right. And I didn't, you know... And I think maybe we uh, we need a more blatant metaphor today than we do 40 years ago. Yeah, stuff could be subtle yeah. and people would pick it up. I think even 20 years ago, things could be a little more subtle yeah. than they are now. Um, all that to say, I mean, I am very happy with the arc that we see of Lori... In this this story, absolutely. Uh, even to the point that I think, in the final moments, when the the three generations of her family can come together mm -hmm. and work together for even for just a few short moments, mm -hmm. it is the only way that they can de defeat the evil. Yeah, and I think that's wonderful to see uh, that eventually they kind of put aside all these kind of family differences and everything mm -hmm. and, and kind of inner turmoil. And work together. Yeah. And there is kind of this overarching kind of theory of, look, women together don't need to be saved. Mm -hmm. They can save themselves. Yeah. And as surprising as it is for me to see that in a story not made by women. Yeah. No, absolutely. I Like I said, again, I didn't even consider the, yeah. that major aspect of it. But one scene that just like flew into my head, and I can't believe I forgot to talk about it when we were really breaking down the movie, was... Um, you keep talking about the arc, and I'm thinking about all the different characters, and I'm trying to keep everything straight in my head. Um, but I liked Allison's arc now that I'm looking back at it, Laurie's granddaughter. I yeah. didn't, when I, the first 20 minutes of the movie, I was already about to write her off. Mm. And then about the middle, I was like, all right, let me give this girl a chance, whatever. And by the end, I wasn't like 100% in love with her like I was so invested in Laurie Strode at the end of the 78 one. But right. I was like, okay, Allison, you pulled me in a little bit. I accept you now. But the one of the things that did was when the pivotal scene at the end of the movie when they are trying to escape Michael Myers and Michael grabs Laurie's ankle, um, Allison's kind of having her own panic moment, PTSD, whatever you want to call it, doesn't really know what to do. And Laurie's like, get her, come on, help me, help me. Yeah. She grabs a knife and she can sever the connection between the two of them. And I'm like, yeah, girl. I'm like, mm -hmm. see, now, you weren't specially trained by your right. vigilante Sarah Connor mother when you were growing up. Like, you were raised normal childhood, but that shit is in your blood. Mm -hmm. You can't fight that. But even so I think... that's, I appreciated that. I was like, yeah, Allison. I think that first spark of that is when she is first being chased and she realized she's being chased by Michael Myers. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, shit. Yeah. Grandma was telling Grandma the truth. Was right. mm -hmm. And I think that's when her story starts to change. Yeah. And I think that moment, she's... You kind of see a moment of her where she goes to get help, and she's, you know, mm -hmm. kind of being comforted by neighbors, and, yeah. and you, you almost see, like, the gears working. Yeah. You know, like, her, like, oh, man, I gotta do the math now. You yeah. Know? Um, like, I'm gonna fit into this puzzle a lot right. more than just being the victim. Because, yeah, like you said, they were comforting her, they had the blanket around her, and then when the cop comes... And takes her away, hopefully to her grandmother's house. She's like, I, she, you, you could, you could kind of see that in her face. Yeah. Like, I'm gonna have bigger fish to fry in a little bit. Where her mother stays conflicted all the way to the moment where she snaps. And yeah. It's like, no, all right, now I know what I'm doing. Which was fucking cool. Well, that was an awesome scene. I do yeah. love the way that plays off. But have it took you... her so long to get there. It did. I know. Have you ever shot stuff? Something? Have With you a ever real gun? Or even just like I've those plates that go in the ball. Okay. Have you? No. And yeah. Okay. The reason I ask is because when Vic does that, it looks like legit. 
Oh, I, I do a lot it. of video I games, dude. That's true. That's also true. <laughs> I look like I don't even know. I'm right-handed, but I don't even know if I'm holding anything the correct way, and my other hand's up here doing no, something. Your right hand would be your but trigger. You're see. Yeah. Didn't know that, but you like you did that. <laughs> I was just say like Resident Evil. Yeah. And, you know. I think she did it during my show, which is not a visual, unfortunately. <laughs> but this, you got to see it, and I want you to be like, hey, that's look at you go, you know, like. I'm a pacifist, by the way. I don't no, she absolutely is, which is why uh, I had to ask you the question of, like, did, I didn't mean, did you ever shoot a... Right, I've never shot a person. ...deer no. or a person or anything. I know you're only no, vegetarian, yeah. so you're not going to shoot a deer, but I was just like, you're, why are, Why do you know how to do that? Probably <laughs> between paintball and, and a laser tag games. and, oh, you know, okay. shit See, like that. I never did. Pop culture. <laughs> <laughs> you learn amazing. skills. You don't know this you have. True. Listen, you, need them. you learn life skills. This it is, is absolutely Absolutely true. Um, but aside from that odd note, sorry, <laughs> that's just funny. Um, uh, just a, a few other moments I just wanted to point out about yeah, Lori, yeah. and I think we did bring up some of these before, but you know, um, there's two other moments that I think are crucial. Um, the moment uh, when the reporters come to talk to her, mm -hmm. and they very much want to get her story, her yeah. side of the story, and she's just like, "Why? What do you want?" It's my story. What do you What do you want? There's no other story. You know mm -hmm. the story. Yeah. Uh, some guy killed five people, and I'm still here. And you're not going to dramatize me and, and victimize put me, me on the yeah, or put me on the front cover of like a National Enquirer type of situation, right. just so you can get listens or what? Right. You know, I'm, I'm making your like, podcast special by being yeah. you know your subject, and I I found that to be the very first. That's the first real scene we see her in, mm -hmm. and I think that sets her as a strong character from that point. Absolutely. Because she is very confident in who she is. And you can see that from the Laurie Strode in the first film. Mm -hmm. She is who she is, and she's yeah. proud of it. And she and never wavers. Like yeah. we said, all these other women in the movie are trying to find their place and trying to find their footing, so and they waver. Sometimes they get scared, but then they come back. She never fucking wavers. Right, just like the, the one babysitter we do see in this film, Vicky, um, Laurie ah. Strode, she spells it wrong, don't worry. Um, Laurie Strode, when she was the babysitter in question, she knew her job. She knew yeah. that she was there to save those kids. She uh -huh. was going to be their protector when she was, you know, when they were in her charge. And I think Vicky's Vicky character doubles that very well. Yeah. Um, and for of all of the teenagers, including Allison, who should be, you know, one of the main three characters, mm -hmm. I think Vicky had a very strong, uh, you know, fleshed out character. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. It, because she was the one tied to the babysitter element mm -hmm. of the story. And I love the interaction she has with that little kid. He's really great. And she is trying to do her job. And mm -hmm. she uh, she's very strong. Yeah. So I, I did appreciate that one teenager in the film. Yeah. Which, unfortunately, she wasn't there for very long either. <laughs> right. But the other <laughs> moment also is when we see Laurie waiting when they're going to move. And, of course, there has to be something that happens that gives the grounds for Michael to get out. So, you know, they're going to move him to a newer, more safe facility or stronger facility mm -hmm. hold and she's there to watch it happen because she's got to be on guard and she's thinking this is going to be the moment that she's going to just take him out mm -hmm. and she can't do it and that struggle in the car and it's all in her face mm -hmm. is very well done yeah um, and that i think uh tells us the story of the 40 years in the middle mm -hmm. yeah and also that is also very reminiscent of, i love that scene too it's also very reminiscent of the end of 78 it just makes that connection so much nicer when loomis does shoot michael and he throws him out over the side of the ba or he projects over the side of the balcony and i you were allowed to see her for a moment kind of crumple and start to cry yeah i say i said in the last episode most uh, movies will just gloss over that part and they wipe their tears and they stand up and they're ready to go again but I'm yeah. like no you've just had this dramatic thing happen to you this traumatic thing happen to you you have to let it settle in and have right. the emotion and we get to see they could have glossed over that or edited out we don't need to see this old broad cry right. they let her cry and have her moment and watch her drink to you know try to calm herself down but it didn't work and then she just broke down that was really important to see, and yeah, yeah, that was a bridge. That was an important character thing, like you said. So, uh, so just like other strong female characters that we've mentioned in this series already, um, the character of Sarah from Day of the Dead in episode four, um, that one moment where we see her break down makes her a real person. Yeah. Right. 
And I, we're talking about Sarah Connor, mm -hmm. you know, Linda Hamilton in the Terminator films. Oh my god. The, the fact that we see her in the beginning of T2, literally in an asylum. Yeah. And you know that she's that, broken, yeah. right? Yeah. That makes her real. Yeah. You know, and she's crying in her memories and in her dreams for the, you know, the future that almost was. Mm -hmm. And those moments, to me, make yeah. these women strong. Mm -hmm. Not just the fact that they can pick up that gun the right way and they know how to point it. <laughs> yeah. But the, uh, you know, their ability to be real people. Yeah. And I think that's, Laurie definitely uh, brings that into this film. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, Yay, women. Yeah, strong chicks are cool. We see Michael Myers walking through trick-or-treaters. Mm. Um, who in this town would be okay with anyone wearing a Michael Myers mask? This is Halloween? Haddonfield, Illinois. He's back home. I mean, seriously. They're not people. selling that at CVS. Right. I mean, if, if I lived in a town that had a history of a mask killer who wore a mask and saw some teenagers wearing that mask... I might think something's up. Yeah. Like, you might be a little off. We've lived through a couple of Halloweens now where they've outlawed certain costumes because oh, yeah. of um, fear of uh, attacks that had happened previously in the year. Like, yeah. I think it was last year or two years ago. The clown They thing. outlawed clowns yeah. because, not because of the, the it phenomenon returning, but because was there was somebody that. in, like, Long Island or Staten Island or something that was dressing up like a clown and scaring people, like, on purpose. Like just on the side like of the road. Yeah. And then, I mean, that, that also ties in with the, uh, uh, right now in movie theaters is the film Joker, which I hope to see this weekend. Oh my god, yeah. There was an, an, a huge update. There was cop the presence. The, the yeah. police and the U.S. Army put out uh, calls for extra security yeah. because of their fear theater. of people being triggered by this film. Yeah. Uh, which is a totally different topic for a different day because I could go off on that one for an hour. Yeah. But it harkens back to the shooting that happened at a screening of, I believe it was Dark Knight Returns. So, there is a tie-in with a, you know, a costume. Yeah. You know, like, and again, it was a clown, because it was Joker. Yeah. So, um... Clowns are not funny. No, okay? Scary, Let's just Can we just things, talk just about stop. that? Yeah, just stop with the fucking clowns. I can't I saw, take it. I, I did actually see a meme the other day that said, with the resurgence of it... And the Joker movie, this is the Halloween of clowns to the left to me, Jokers to the right. Very clever. Stuck in the middle with you. <laughs> it makes me want to cut somebody's ear off. Oh my god, I love it. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, all this to yeah. say, I think if you showed up in Haddonfield wearing a Michael yeah, Spires mask that's not on okay. Halloween, yeah. people would freak the fuck out. I don't care if it's 40 years it later. In. It doesn't matter. That's one of those yeah. things that's just like a societal no-no, yeah. and you wouldn't do it. Exactly. So I, I don't think that would fly. And especially an adult. It yeah. If it's a five-year-old, people might just look the other way and be like, well, the parents right. aren't raising them right. But this is an adult male walking it's around like with when, a when glimmering you a little kid kitchen knife. In like a Jason outfit. You're or like, like a six year old adorable. and like, oh, that's a little yeah. weird. Or like, I've seen the kids dressed like Pinhead or Leatherface. And I'm like, that's a little weird. Yeah. You shouldn't well, know what that is yet. Yeah, well, that's true. But I've, there was something I just saw recently where it was an adult dressed up as uh, Pennywise and a child dressed up as Georgie. With the arm and the oh. slicker. And I'm like, come Two on. That's, that's not, crazy. That's not, nice. <laughs> that's not cute or nice. I mean, oh. aside from the whole sexy Pennywise phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Which, yeah. Alright, sexy any horror no, movie icon. No, never sexy not Michael sexy. Myers anything. No, what sex, the, I've seen sexy Freddy. That's, sexy Leatherface. That's what the fuck? stupid. Alright, so moving right along, let's get back to our Blu-ray special for today. And let's talk a little bit about the extras. So good. Um, they're very short. They were short. All right, they could have been longer. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to just kind of do a quick comparison on what I like and don't like on Blu-rays. So, we, we, since we've been talking about it, let's do this Halloween 2 Scream Factory Shout Factory Edition. What um, is the... What did you just say is the Shout Factory? Shout Factory, uh, when their horror films are on a line called Scream Factory. Oh, okay. These are the guys also put out Mystery Science Theater DVDs, ah, which we have many okay. of in this household. <laughs> but uh, what I want to say is uh, when a movie is new, uh, when you see a movie in the theater and you're like, wow, that's great. I really want to go pick this up on Blu-ray and find out more about that it. extra stuff, yeah. And the extras are short and they're um, very junkety. They're, um, when I say junkety, I mean like a press junket. Yeah. They're all conveniently shot on set. And, you know, like you, have, you see in the background people busily working, making the movie that they're talking about. Yeah. And it has this kind of 
what back in the day would have been filler between movies on like HBO or Showtime or the movie Yes. Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. we used to watch that stuff all the time mm -hmm. as kind of previews. Um, not the trailer, but a preview would be like this extended behind the scenes of a movie coming to a theater near you. Mm -hmm. And they all feel like that, especially on this disc. Yeah. Um, and I tend to see that on a lot of Blu-rays. And if, I'm sorry, if I've already seen your movie enough that I want to go buy it and watch it again, I want more than that. Mm -hmm. um, so all of the, the stuff that's on here could have been boiled down into one 20-minute piece that probably would have been a lot stronger. Mm -hmm. That's my personal take. That's why I prefer when you get like a special edition or collector's edition <clears throat> on a movie that's at least a good 15, 20 years old, 30 years old, um, you have these great retrospective pieces that that's will cool. yeah. go back and talk to the people who made the film. Uh, I don't see why we're not doing that more with these because just because it's a modern film, I mean, I want more than five minutes with the director talking about why he wanted to need, needed to make this movie, right? Um, but what we do see is we have a, a collection of short pieces uh, all under like 10 minutes. Yeah, one of them was like two. Yeah, there were two of them that were like two and a half minutes. And mm -hmm. I'm like, like and, and you get excited when you see the titles, right? Yeah. Like, there was one that was like Scream Queen. Yes, and we were both like, yes, let's yeah. watch more about Jamie Lee Curtis. So the and original it was Scream Queen. Two minutes long. Right, and it's just like her talking for like 30 seconds. And it was like, <sighs> yeah, it was too short. It was Jamie Lee Curtis a little bit, but it was like the director talking about how important it was for Jamie Lee Curtis to get the, to use the character of Laurie Strode to tell her own story. All right. If I want to see a piece about a scream queen, then I would like to see the woman talking mm -hmm. about what it felt. What was why was it important for her to come do this movie? Mm -hmm. You know, like if I'm going to do a retrospective piece, do a retrospective piece. Don't mm -hmm. give me a two minute promo tease. Um, yeah. with the director telling me why it was important to bring her back. Yeah. Ironically, in one of the ones, I don't remember what it was entitled, but there was a, uh, like a round table, I guess. Oh, of, that was the legacy piece. Okay. It was um, Jamie Lee Curtis, John Carpenter, um, was it Danny McBride? And then uh, the no, guy from it was, Blumhouse? It was or the it was, director. Gr oh, uh, David Green. Gordon Green. Yeah, and, and then and the then, guy from Blumhouse. Right. And they were sitting in a circle and talking. And Jamie Lee Curtis did a lot of the um, really really meaty, important background yeah. information, which was wonderful. Um, but one of the things she said that I really appreciated, because nobody had really touched upon this yet, was um, she had given a lot of respect to Deborah Hill for establishing yes. the girls in the 1978 movie and their relationship and making them so 3D that she didn't say that this movie didn't have, I'm saying that this movie didn't have. Right. But she appreciated that that was what they got to start with. So probably if she had been asked, oh, what does it mean to you to play Laurie Strode? Her answer would have been a lot of that, well, mm -hmm. um, coming to terms with this tragic event at an, as an 18-year-old girl, right. and then 40 years later, and what does that look like to me as an adult woman, and blah, 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 blah. So that like could have been so much more like a, right. an opening line to a path of conversation that could have been amazing and then it just went like Pfft. and I, I feel like I got that more from watching her on Good Morning America and good, you know good yeah. New York and but all that's that not why you're buying Blu-rays right so stuff. it's like, like hearing her talk you know about how you know this is a story of how traumatic events and sur women who survive Survival. trauma thank you yeah. right survive surviving trauma as a woman and how it affects your family and your life, and the, yeah. women, and the women in your life. Yeah. And she said that on three different talk shows. Uh, she even said that on The View. I'm not a big View watcher, uh, but she's. I watched because Jamie Lee Curtis was on, and she talked sure. about that on The View. The, the guys putting together this little junket should have asked her and given her that platform to say that again yeah. here. Um, or to and that, and expand upon it, because right. you're not... In those morning shows and on a view and stuff like that, you're restricted to a time limit because right. you have other guests and stuff so coming So she up. knew that's what she wanted to talk about. Exactly, and that's wonderful. Right. In this day, no time limit. Yeah. This is a Blu-ray. This is a bonus. This is for super fans, right? Yep. So y'all will watch a 45-minute expose yeah, on her talking about the importance of, you know, the, all the, the trauma and the survival and the stuff like that. And I think you guys know from watching this series so far... That's what I want to do. That's what I want to. I want to buy these Blu-rays. I want to tell yeah. you to watch them because we need to know all of those things about yeah. character that you can get with some retrospective. Yeah. I'm afraid we're gonna have to wait till this movie hits some big anniversary mark and they re-release it to get that kind of information. But those people ain't getting any younger. Right. 
So you got to catch those interviews now when the right. main star is 60 something years old right. and the director is, or the previous director or right. the, the poser, producer who's yeah, the is who is how old now? He's getting close to 80, right? Hi. He's in his 70s. So that's old. I mean, and people don't wait till they're old <clears throat> to die anymore either. So you got to, you got to nail the horror on. industry knows that. Well, We've seen. Dude, I know you people. How many <laughs> you people lose a like, lot of people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the horror industry knows that well. We have to yeah. preserve what we have of these people now. Yeah, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I bring you Indie Call Horror because you know I have had the chance to talk to some to of these people these that people. are no longer with us. Yeah, George Romero. Uh, how many times would I wish that I could have sat down with him and done more than five minutes of talking? I'm sure, so many people have that same wish. Right, you know? and I mean, I know that I was very lucky to get the five minutes I got, but yeah. I know. You know, it's it's uh it's sad to see that we have the opportunity on a Blu-ray like this to be like, John, hey, I mean... John Carp, why don't you tell us? Because he does tell us a little bit about you know what what the p purpose and the point was of making the original Halloween. I want to hear what did you think? Why was it important for you to be involved in this one? Mm -hmm. Right, you got the chance to talk about it now. The best part of the extras is the score. The way they go over how that was, that came out to be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love how they they knew they wanted to keep that iconic piece of music with um, which Vic mentioned on the first iteration of the horror academic with those high strings and that really notable and notable notes. And the movie would not be scary at all if it didn't have that suspenseful you know lead in music coming in. And now it's so recognizable. <clears throat> um, but they got to take that and not change it in any kind of drastic way. They knew how important those particular notes and in that in that that sound, those sounds were to this particular horror icon, but they knew they wanted to just um, mature them a little bit like they did with, you know, Laurie's character, the same thing. Um, so they sped it up a little bit where they felt they needed to speed it up a little bit. They added, I know there was like a very different guitar sound. Not a different guitar sound, but a different instrument, I think, that was added to it. Like that guitar. There really isn't guitars um, in the original. No, so there's not. The fact that they add, there's this very drony guitar. Thank you. That's the word yeah, I can think and, of. And yeah. it's great. In the extra, you see them recording it, and it's, yeah. it's a bowed and, guitar, which is beautiful. Yeah, and that just, it really did add a lot. It added, like, still... This, they made these, both of these movies with no jump scares. I think there was one time in this movie where There's I hit behind my notebook. With the, uh, with the porch lights. Uh, yeah, the damn motion lights. Because it's darker <laughs> than it's not, and then it's darker than it's not. Yeah. Um, but they really can do so much with the music. And what was special to me that I noticed, and we keep talking about the, um, you know, your uh, connecting with your foremothers and finding strength in your blood that has been, you know, passed down from generation to generation... Uh, John Carpenter got to work on the score with his son, so watching these three guys, the third guy being a you know, very close collaborator with them for many, many years, and to hear John Carpenter's kid, who you know has always studied music and has always been a fan, talk about like, oh, you know, students in my class have always asked me to play that riff, mm -hmm. and that's just been a staple throughout the course of my life, but he didn't have that like condescending look on his face when he was talking about it. He was proud. Yeah. He's like, I'm a carpenter. This is what we do. Yeah. Like, And he got to exp expound upon that with his dad, and so it's just like the, bringing in those family ties into a movie that already has such a theme of that was really cool. Yeah. And yeah, I'm not surprised you bought the score. I'm about to run out and buy the damn score because it, it was, was good. so good. It was so good, but... Um, Cause I, I even you get like a little bit of like a little, I got a little giddy watching the extra because there's a point they do all of this kind of with this backdrop set of the Myers house from the original movie mm -hmm. kind of run down with the Strode family for sale sign yeah <laughs> and uh, you're kind of like uh, it's not really in this movie but okay it's cute yeah um, so that's a backdrop for a lot of these interview sequences and. Uh, there's a moment where they have literally Carpenter sitting with a keyboard mm -hmm. in front of the stro the you know the, the the Myers house. Yeah. And he's like, "Well, we we did this with the score because I, you know, my father taught me and we learn uh, if if you've read a, about Carpenter, his father was a music professor in college. Uh, he uh, you know, my father taught me about the 5/4 and this and, and I'm going to mm -hmm. I'm going to learn this was just a scale that I you know, I always got to put these together when I learn that. And it's it was so cool to see him explain that. That's what we needed more of. Yeah. You know, that that was a great moment. And then to see his son with the three of them in the, their home studio and the son saying how, you know, we wanted to enhance what we already had yeah. with this great score. Mm -hmm. So, 
If nothing else, for these extras, I highly recommend you watch the one about the score. There's mm -hmm. also a nice little piece about the history of the making of the mask. Yes, which I dug that, that was as well. very cool, which we talked about last episode. We definitely did, but also, I really like, like, it. you wouldn't think it would take so much detail work to make that... Uh, mask look 40 years more aged. Yeah. But the fine tuning that went into that thing, and again, I'm not an I'm not a visual artist, uh, so for me that was amazing. But they just it took them you know five six hours at a clip to just really get in there and not Every just be like looking crazy. Yeah, yeah, not just it throws some dirt on it and it's dirty. No, it's not just dirty. It's worn. Yeah. There's like you know it's a cellular visceral level of you know stuff that's collected over this thing and we don't know where it's been granted the attorney general's had it and then it went to britain and like this place is, the thing has been all over the place so we've had to see its life and you got to see its life because of these amazing visual artists get yeah. in there with probably like these tiny like i'm trying to do it with my pen i'm like these tiny little paintbrushes or whatever they did and and then to hear that yes what we talked about in the last episode how we know it was a shatner halloween mask or a, a Captain Kirk Halloween mask. Yeah. Um, but what they had to do to it extra, like I didn't know that there were like sideburns on it that they had chopped yeah. off and that they had made the eye holes bigger to really give it that vapid look. Yeah. And you know, and then when they spray painted it, I just thought they bought one and spray painted it and the job was done. Um, but that they had to actually put in a little work into it. Like, so all of these visual artists coming together and going yeah. like, what do we want this to really look like? The funny thing is, cool. is that, they, I mean, that was a really cool piece. Yeah. It was maybe five minutes. I know. And See, you want more. Did, you're you really probably like, more. wow, that thing had to have been 30 minutes what you watch because right. all the stuff you just said. Yeah, yeah, I just talk a lot. So I added more It takes more a long time to explain like... what we see. Yeah. But, um, but no, I mean, that's what I'm saying. There's gems on here, but we want more. Yeah. You know, I'm sure I didn't listen to the commentary track. I'm sure that there might be. I don't even know if there is a commentary track. That I'm thinking I don't about. know. And I mean, like I said, if you guys are, if you're horror fans or fans of any kind of movies like this and they these blu-rays are not cheap yeah and if they make these prices the way they are and you're buying it because you want all these extras and we're living in an age where extras. you know physical media is going away and yeah. this is not helping the product no um, no it's not i'm gonna buy the movie because i want to see the movie again and but make sure i buy the movie as opposed to streaming yeah. the movie but also you know? you're a collector right obviously right but i'm There's saying this is this is an you, issue that the physical media is going away because of um, a lot of people are going to look at it and go, oh, I don't really need to see all that stuff. I'll just, I'll just stream it instead. Yeah. Um, and that's unfortunate, but, uh, you know, uh, see me in 10 years and we'll see if there's a nice Blu-ray edition to go with this. Perhaps that's why I don't talk about new movies on this show too often. But <laughs> yeah, it was, maybe. it was very topical for us to kind of go through and bookend those films that way. Sure. And, and I think it was a good experience. Thank you so much for tuning in for our all the horror special editions of <laughs> both the Brook Reading Podcast and the Horror Academic, and I appreciate you tagging along on my side. Oh and, my god, uh, absolutely. <laughs> and I was very honored to be, uh, once again, a guest on your show, so that we could talk about Halloween and Halloween 2018, and we could do our part to be a little bit of the part of all the horror. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So thanks again for uh, tuning in. Uh, it would probably be a long time before we talk about a new movie again. But uh, uh, thanks for being part of this, and I hope you're enjoying All the Horror. Remember, that's hashtag All the Horror on Twitter mm -hmm. or at All the Horror 18. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and on Facebook, there's the Facebook group All the Horror. There's more stuff coming out. Pay attention to what's going on, and you'll find plenty more podcasts, music, art. Uh, stories, everything. So much cool content. That's coming out on all the horror. Uh, thanks for bearing with me with this cold. And thank you, Melissa, for sticking it out with me. Bye. Thanks Bye. for watching. See you next time.